Hey there, welcome back to the Path to Zion podcast. We are getting into the latest series. I don't claim to know how many parts it's going to be, but it is titled, When the One Who Deserves Judgment is You. We looked a little bit at 2 Samuel chapter 12, beginning to talk about David being confronted by Nathan to say, hey, you know what? Here comes the word of the Lord. You better buckle up because this is going to hurt a little bit. We saw the interesting account of a little bit of a parable type word from God to speak to David. He paints this, this portrait of this just really rotten guy. I mean, like this man is really, really evil. And it's told in just one tiny little story, if you will, about the man who's who's wealthy. He has hills covered with animals. And this dude next door to him has one little baby lamb that he raises from birth and like pets it and feeds it and like it sleeps in his bed at night. <laughs> it's like one of his children. And this guy comes into town into the rich man's house and he needs a meal. So instead of going to his flock, he goes to the man with the with the little ewe lamb and he says, you know what? Hey, brother, give me your lamb. It's dinner time. And he kills and presents this little lamb of this man's family as the meal. David hears this story and he freaks out. He says, no way is that happening. Are you kidding me? We looked at one of the versions that, said he, that says he exploded in anger against this man. This man had no pity. This man needs to pay back four times over. This man deserves death. The word of the Lord comes through Nathan. says, David, sit down, brother. You are this man. It's you. Whew, that would be a rough afternoon. David has some things to chew on, and that's where we're at right now. 2 Samuel chapter 12, we're going to pick up in verse 13. We've already read the text 1 through 23, but we're going to come and pick right up in verse 30, uh, verse 13. Because I want to be clear, at David's first response in this account, the first thing we're told about when David hears this horrendously hard news, that guess what? It's you. <laughs> oh man, and then it just... Then it gets specific where the word of the Lord comes through Nathan to tell him the specifics of why he, in fact, is that man. Because of what he did. Because of what was in his heart. Because of the 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 outflow of what was in his heart and what he did because of that. So in verse 13, we hear from David. He's getting the rod of correction like super size. I mean, he is getting it. He is getting the correction of Yahweh in a super intense way. And what does he say? David says to Nathan, I have sinned against the Lord. Okay. Very first thing he says was not, well, <laughs> justification, justification. I was doing this because of this. Oops. Or I shouldn't have. I have sinned against the Lord. And Nathan said to David, this is the same verse now, the Lord also has taken away your sin, you shall not die. I find it interesting that, that in the first part of verse 13, we see David's immediate response to the correction was he received the correction. He didn't argue with the correction and he immediately responded with confession. In the very next sentence, in the same verse, Nathan proceeds to tell David that Yahweh has caused his sin to pass away and that he himself will not die. Now, this got my train of thought going. And I had to wonder when I was reading this this morning and started writing, writing according to what I was reading, if this was an instantaneous word to Nathan based solely upon David's response and confession. Could we say, at least in speculation, could we wonder if David would have himself been deemed cursed to die instead of his offspring had he not received the word of the Lord that was against him and turned immediately? 
Some may say that's me reading into it. I don't think so. I think it's very clearly spelled out, although in small measure I know. The Lord has taken away your sin. You shall not die. Okay, so could we say that, again, it's at least possible that in speculation, of course, as I'm trying to make very clear, that if perhaps if David had not responded in immediate confession, admittance to his wrong, I myself have sinned against the Lord, that death may have been for him in seven days. Right? It's at least possible. I wondered that when I read that this morning. We'll move on. Verse 9 is interesting. Let's pop back a little bit in in, uh, chapter 12, verse 9. So why have you shown such contempt for the word of Adonai and done what I see as evil? Again, now this this is God speaking through the prophet to David. He is he is asking David a question. Okay? Depending on which version you're reading, I know a lot of things are dependent upon that. But he's saying, Why have you shown such contempt for my word? And why have you done what I see as evil? Yahweh goes on and he answers his own question, basically, and at the end, he adds that he himself sees David's actions as evil. He didn't mention whether or not David defines it as evil. He didn't say, Nathan the prophet says it's evil. He didn't submit it as a question. He makes it clear he alone, Yahweh God, holds the final word on what is evil. I see as evil. He declares judgment upon David, extremely harsh judgment, by the way. (laughs) It culminates in the death of his son by Uriah's wife. We know that. We know that that's the way this part of the text ends. Because of his turning, God says, you know what? You're not going to die, but the curse will come. I use the word curse. Maybe that's not accurate if you're going to get real specific. I see it as, as, if nothing else, we can say it is just the result. The result of your evil actions is the death of this child. Okay? Okay. So strong is God's displeasure with David's murderous actions, which was what we're told in there, the spilling of blood, that Yahweh declares that, quote, the sword will never leave your house. Now, we know that this prophecy would be fulfilled. Okay, we know that because we know, we know the rest of the story. We know what follows. We know what other accounts of David's life transpire. We know that this is absolutely fulfilled and that David would remain a man of war. And even at the end of his days, Yahweh told David, quote, You are not to build a house for my name. Okay, well, why? Now, I've talked about a little, I talked a little about this. I don't know, several weeks ago in a lot in just personal conversations with people that at the end of the day of, of, of David's life, at the end of his days, he is wanting, of course, to build the house of the Lord. And he had gathered all the materials, man, he's ready to go. And the Lord says, no, you are not to build a house for my name. Well, why? Because you are a man of war. You have shed blood. Which goes back to the beginning of 12 when, when this violent man is a man of great anger. And, and I don't even go into that. There's a lot within that that I'm chewing on that's going to be for a later date. But I want to be absolutely clear that there is something within this that God's displeasure with David, David's actions in regarding to the spilling of blood He declares to David, the sword will never leave your house. And we know that was fulfilled. We know, according to the scripture, that David's life was defined by a lot of violence. We know that. More on that at a later time. Very intriguing nonetheless, because he did remain a man of war for the rest of his life. I find it interesting that um, when I was looking into this and doing some different word studies, that blood is dom, D-A-M. It's first used back in Genesis where the dom of Abel was crying out from the ground. 
okay? Because you have shed Dom. Now, I didn't have time to look into. I know that the Hebrew for man is Adam. I'm guessing there's a direct, a direct connection with that because obviously we know that the blood, the life blood, is the man. I mean, it, you know, life is in the blood, and we know that, and the whole sacrificial system and all this and that and the other. But there is something about this spilling of Dom. And we know, and I, I talk about this all the time, I referenced it two episodes ago, and I said, look, I don't talk about this on the podcast nearly as much as I think about it, but I think so much about the spirit of Cain. Spilled blood in vengeance, personal advancement, is evil in the sight of the Lord, and it demands judgment. It is rooted in the spirit of Cain. Why? The Dom was crying out, from the ground. And I'm telling y'all, I believe God hears that and I believe it grieves his heart. I believe that the life blood, the blood that holds so much life and meant so much to Yahweh throughout all of the timeline of humanity, so much so that the the sprinkling of the blood, the 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 spilling of the blood on the cross, the the sacrificial system in the in the litter, let's just be graphic, right? The buckets and buckets of quantity of blood has such substance in the eyes of God. And we have to hold that really rightly, friends. We have to hold that really tenderly and honor that reality. I'd like to briefly point out that David did all that he could to prevent the prophesied word of the Lord coming to pass in regards to his son. This is another point I just want to make clear. Okay, so we ourselves are as David. We hear of if if someone if the Lord would send a prophet to your house tonight and he knocks on the door. Uh, hey, uh, can I come in for a minute? I'm uh, the prophet of God. I'm here on Yahweh's behalf. I have a message for you. Oh, sure, brother. Come on in. Hey, health, wealth, what you got? It's a new year. What am I going to get, brother? A promotion? A new car? What? What is it? Well, I got some bad news. It's going to be kind of hard. You might want to sit down because this is going to sting real bad. But I'm going to preface it with a little story for you. I'm going to tell you a little parable. You like stories? Oh, yeah, I love stories. Let's do that first because I sure don't want to get to the correction. So the prophet of God says he's standing in your living room, and he says, go ahead and sit down. I'm going to tell you a little story. And he tells you this story similar to the one that David heard through Nathan. And you hear this story, and you go, man, that guy, God totally needs to lay that guy out. If there is any man who deserves the wrath of God, it is that man right there. God, go get him. Amen. What else you got, prophet? Okay, well, you remember how when I got here, I told you I've got some bad news? Brother, that guy is you. It's you. I'm telling you, we have got to get this through our hard-headed, hard-heartedness. This is us. It is us. And so knowing that, giving ourselves to get that through our skulls, that this is in fact our story, just like it was David's story, that we have something to reckon with. We have something to face that if we're not careful will be the rock, the stumbling block rock of offense Messiah that comes to us and says, you know what? We need to talk. There are some things in you that are evil and vile and just like Saul They are opposing me, friend. You're murdering me. You are my enemy, and you don't even know it. Friends, we've got to be real, we've got to be like for real willing to give ourselves to the possibility that this is in fact true. Okay, so what do we do? We hear that, we feel that in our hearts from the conviction of the Holy Spirit in our modern day version, if you will. And hopefully, if we follow this pattern, we say, oh God, I have sinned against you. I've sinned against you. And God, because of that, again, let's stick exactly to this text, perhaps God turns a little bit. And you know what? 
were not immediately reprimanded as David was spared from death. Okay? So there's some things, though, specifically I don't want to get past myself. David did all that he could to prevent the prophesied word of the Lord coming to pass in regards to his son. He responded in humility. He admitted his iniquity. He heard the word of the Lord, and he told Nathan he had sinned. Then he goes on to what? He inquired of the Lord for the child. Now we are in 2 Samuel 12, verse 16. He fasted. He laid all night on the ground. He denied getting up and eating with his brothers. A week later, the child dies. His actions demanded a judgment. Like we equally saw, he, this is exactly what we saw in his being forbidden to build the house of the Lord in the latter years of his life. There is a cost, friends, for how we live. There is a cost, there is a price to pay for the things we do in this body. There are things we will be allowed to do and not be allowed to do, I think, according to what we do with what we've been given, with who we are and what we actually do in this life. We, I would say we're very ignorant if we just bask in the work of the Messiah and think, well, we're all covered in grace. We're all covered in grace. Well, listen, here's something I believe the Spirit of the Lord is saying right here in this second. I will submit to you as a possibility. You know what? You're not just covered in grace. You know what you're covered in? You're covered in blood. Let that sink in, friend, if you are, in fact, in Messiah. You're not just covered in grace. You're covered in blood. And that's a whole different story to me. That's why I live the way I do. That's why I choose to deny myself in a way that really, really, really pigeonholes me is too much. Too much. You know what? For whatever reason, I feel like I have some understanding that brands me as very strange now. I'm covered in the blood. I have to be holy. I have to be right. Oh, Lord, I'm a man of unclean lips. Cleanse me, pur- purge me, purify me, please, God. Search me, know me, dig around in me, look around for unclean things. They've got to go because I'm covered in the blood. And it's holy, and it's righteous, and it's sacred. (sighs) There are consequences to what we do, friends. Yes, Lord, the Lord is slow to anger. He's full of compassion. His love never ends and it's immeasurable. Yes and amen on all these points. But there is a price to what we do. We have to live that way. But we're clearly shown David's deep level of grief over God's judgment. Verse 18. In the seventh day, the child died, and the servants of David were afraid to tell him the child was dead. In summary, I think this is saying, look, David's going to be suicidal, y'all. If we tell him that his son has died, he may kill himself. He may take his own life because he was so distraught. He's on the dirt. He won't eat. He's probably not sleeping. He won't even get up off the floor. And so they're afraid to tell him. We can't tell him. What will he do next? He is doing all that he can to get through to the Lord and plead for the life of his son. He acknowledged his sin. Oh, Lord, please. I think this is a lot of the Psalms, y'all. Lord, please turn away your anger. Please turn away your wrath. Please, please forgive me. Please remember your covenant. All these things. I think it was through these circumstances that David was crying out from his innermost places, Oh God, I deserve death. I deserve your hand of judgment. But please turn away. Please turn away. 
But what we see in David's response is strikingly different than what these people were expecting. Let's go to verse 19. But when David saw that his servants were whispering together, he perceived that the child was dead. So David said to his servants, is the child dead? And they said, yes, he is. So David, he gets up off the ground. He washes. He anoints himself. He changed his clothes. And he came in to the house of the Lord and worshiped. <sighs> Friends, this speaks so deeply to me at what the church has got to wake up and realize. The principles within this text alone, one tiny little snippet of the eternal word of God, can speak to us for days about patterns we need to implement in our lives. So David gets up, cleans himself, changes his clothes, anoints himself, goes to the house of the Lord. He worships there. Then he returns to the house, cleaned up, seemingly moving on. His servants can't figure it out, right? (laughs) But this is a good, good, good principle for us to learn. While the child was still alive, I fasted. I wept. Why? Because I said, who knows? The Lord may be gracious to me. Maybe the child will live. He acknowledges that the judgment of God that was prophesied came to pass and the child was gone. He said, why should I fast now? I can't bring him back. He's not returning. God's judgment has been accomplished. In a sense, I would like to say he joined with that in agreement and said amen. Now we say amen because we like something. Amen means so be it. I think he set his agreement with the judgment of God. I hadn't thought of that till right this second. I submit that as a possibility. He's fasting. He's praying. He's weeping. His emotions are high. He's emptying himself in repentance, in, in feeling like he's owning up to it again, but he's still seeking the Lord. Be gracious to me. Maybe you will turn your anger away. That I do deserve now. That is justly mine. But he didn't. The child dies. The prophecy comes to pass to fruition. The child is gone. I believe, I submit the possibility that David's actions that were told of here in 2 Samuel 12 is in fact a version of him saying, Amen, so be it. I was evil. I needed judgment and correction. Yahweh, your judgment has come. So be it. The child is gone. I think that would do us good to learn these things, friend. I'm going to make part three and then we're going to wrap this up. When the one who deserves judgment is you. Friends, we've got to be grown men. I'm so tired of the church that I've known my whole life pushing off responsibility on everyone else and enjoying enjoying now pointing the finger at everybody else out there who's evil it's time to turn our hands around and look at ourselves because the scripture is making it clear that sometimes the one who deserves judgment is me amen